So um, next will be on flagger and service meshes. And we do have a 15 minute break after this. So um, we have told Damani he'll be coming in later, but we can dig in a little bit into that 15 minute break if you need to. So uh, hopefully you guys can stick around if we run a little bit over. So that I'll just hand it over. Thanks. Thanks, Tawa. Okay, so what comes after continuous delivery? <laughs> Progressive delivery. Um, and I'm going to talk about progressive delivery in the GitOps um, mindset. Um, so what is progressive delivery? Um, the idea is that you want to uh, introduce new software versions in your production cluster um, and have less risk than just, you know, here is the new version. How can you achieve that is by gradually exposing that new version to your users. So instead of just rolling everything to all your users, you will be rolling to a small percentage. You can increase that percentage and so on. Um, that's the way camera releases work, but there is also another way through A-B testing where you segment your users and say, hey, I want to do these tests only on this segment of my users. Now, how can you uh, achieve progressive delivery in your, in your organization? You need some ingredients. Um, like before, uh, the same thing that applies to GitOps, um, the CI pipeline should produce immutable artifacts so you can know what's version A, what's version B. Um, your CD pipeline should reconcile the desired state. So if you are moving from a version to another, you have to have this um, control loop that applies that new version in the cluster. Um, so let's say here is taken care about but by what I've talked before. Uh, the new ingredients on top of what GitOps needs are for progressive delivery are smart routing. So you need something inside your cluster that's more than just layer four routing. So more than just a Kubernetes CNI implementation, something that understands HTTP, gRPC, layer seven protocol um, things. So you can look at the, at the requests and then you can take decisions if you understand what that request um, wants to do, then you can take decisions based on those information. For example, HTTP headers and all, all this stuff. Um, and of course, you need some kind of observability for your system. Um, and observability is such a broad um, thing. Um, for example, service meshes offer some part of observability by providing you with performance stats um, for your layer seven traffic. For example, you can, a service mesh can tell you if an application uh, returns 500 errors or 404s, stuff like that. Also, um, most service meshes out there uh, can, um, tell you the latency of HTTP requests. So you can, you can tell if uh, a new version is slower than the old version, for example, maybe your SLA is for, let's say, uh, the maximum time a request should be serviced is uh, half a second. And maybe your new version adds some latency to that and it goes to two seconds, for example, you, uh, you, can, uh, you can monitor, you can observe this kind of change using a service mesh without having to instrument your app, without your app having to report this kind of information uh, to some monitoring system. But that's a small part of the observability story. Um, if you want to take decisions based on app behavior, then you should be instrumenting your app uh, and expose things like business metrics. I don't know, um, how many clients clicked on a button or uh, how many, I don't know, queries on the database I've been doing th 
through this request, something like that. So observability is somehow mistaken for a thing that you just get when you use a service mesh. Um, you get some part of it, but it's just about performance stats. Uh, and that's where service mesh role ends. So Flagger is a, it's a project uh, we started in 2018. And when we started this project, we set up some goals. And the major goal with the was to give confidence uh, in automate, automating the production releases. Um, what we've seen with, uh, with tools like Flux and other um, GitOps operators, it's OK. You, you bump your version in your Git repository, a new image tag, for example that application, that version gets deployed. Um, let's say the health checks are working, liveness probe, readiness probes. And after a couple of seconds, after the application is rolled out, it starts to error up. It starts to I don't know, return 500 errors uh, to your users. It's not something that um, a cluster reconciler should be looking after, like what's is the app functioning correctly? Like from a Kubernetes perspective, if the readiness and liftness uh, probes are okay, then your app is okay, right? Um, so Flagger extends on, on this kind of, um, of health assessment. So it doesn't look only at, at um, readiness probes or liftness probes, it looks at what your app is doing while you are exposing it to your uh, live traffic. So how do we give uh, this kind of confidence to developers? Then to give this kind of confidence, we, we allow developers to define the validation process. So you can set thresholds, you can uh, determine your SLAs, your KPIs, and uh, define those in a uh, custom resource and say, hey, this is the way the application should behave when it's uh, deployed on production. If it breaches these thresholds, if it reaches these thresholds, then roll it back uh, and so on. Um, also, a goal is was for Flagger to be able to run testing uh, in a production cluster. And, you may say, why do I need to run my uh, integration test in production? I have integration tests for, let's say, staging or development uh, environments. Well, staging and dev should be identical to production, but usually it's not. So maybe you should be running, again, your conformance tests before exposing the, yeah, the new version to, to users, maybe those tests will look different on your production system. So Flagger has a thing called webhooks and it can uh, trigger uh, conformance testing, look at those results. And if those results look okay, only then advance um, the rollout. Some organizations have don't trust automation 100%. Maybe you are dealing with um, let's say some very sensitive workloads. And maybe you have a team uh, managed by a release manager that wants to click buttons and wants to approve everything. Uh, so that's why Flagger has a way for you to do manual gating, right? You can approve a rollout, you can roll it back uh, whenever you want um, and so on. I'll, I'll be talking about that later. And of course, Flagger is able to, uh, to do automated rollbacks if your KPAs, your thresholds are, um, are over the limit. Now, an another goal will be how can I observe the actual rollout? Right? I mean, Flagger can, can shift traffic, but how can I get some feedback from it? And um, Flagger does it through Kubernetes events. Um, it, can also write to Slack, to Discord, to all sorts of um, chat platforms and report to your team what uh, was the status with, with your deployments. And 
Flagger also exposes Prometheus metrics for every single uh, process that it manage, manages. So you can create uh, alerts with uh, Prometheus Alert Manager. So it can be pinged on pager duty or um, any other alerting system you may, you may be using uh, when, um, when a rollout uh, fails, when it is rolled back and so on. Another goal was to write as little YAML as possible. And I will, I will give you an example of what that means. And of course, the whole process has to be managed from Git. So Flagger should be able to work with, uh, with a, a cluster reconciler with a GitOps operator. And the, the, the cluster reconciler and Flagger it's a strange combination because Flagger has to change things inside your cluster to make this progressive uh, delivery work. So if Flagger would change things that you have committed to Git, then the GitOps operator will undo it, right? So they will be fighting on the same resources. Um, and Flagger does things in a particular way just to accommodate and work together with a, with a cluster reconciler. So yeah, Flagger automates the release process. It can gradually shift traffic or uh, it can route traffic based on headers, cookies, and comes with a declarative model for decoupling the deployment from the actual release. So if you if you think you are, you are doing deployments from Git, that doesn't actually mean that it's also a release. We can decouple these two things, like the cluster reconciler, the GitOps operator can do the deployment and afterwards something else like Flagger, another operator takes over and does the actual release process. Um, Flagger implements a couple of deployment strategies. Uh, it started with, uh, in the first implementation was progressive traffic shifting, uh, but that proved to not work for front-end apps. Uh, and I'll give you an example. If your front-end application has, let's say, static content like HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and then it also exposes a web API, right? So you have all these things. Um, if you do progressive traffic shifting based on weight and a client opens, a client being the browser, the browser makes several requests to your application. Once, one to get the HTML, another one to get the CSS and so on. When you do traffic shifting based on weight, let's say 10% to the new version, 90% to the old version, there is a huge chance that one of your users that is using a browser will get the HTML from the new version with the CSS from the old version. And you can clearly see that it will get messy. You'll not be able to uh, deliver a good experience to your users if you are, if you are just uh, shifting traffic based on weight. For front-end apps that have this, um, this feature where that needs some kind of session affinity, you can use um, another deployment strategy called A-B testing that's based on looking at headers and cookies and routing based on informations, information stored in, in, a, in a header or, or a cookie somehow. So for example, you can um, segment your users based on the user agent. You can say, I want to test my version only on uh, Firefox users, or I want to test my new version um, on mobile users. So you have the user agent that has a lot of information about, about, your, uh, about your clients and you can segment them like that. Or if you are using uh, more advanced systems that are injecting HTTP headers, for example, Cloudflare, I think they are injecting the location uh, header. So you could do A-B testing based on location. You can say a particular country or a city or stuff like that. And you can use uh, that as a, 
as a way to segment your users. And another good practice that I've seen is you can have an insiders program where your users are opting in to be your guinea pigs and you um, give them some advantages for that. So when, when you spin up a new, uh, new version, you can route only the insider, only the users that are in your insiders program to that new version and use them for testing. That's, that's how AB testing works. Um, Another strategy is uh, blue-green with traffic mirroring. And it works great if your apps are idempotent or APIs. For example, um, let's say a machine learning uh, workload that does some computation and gives you back a result. Um, you can compare uh, a new version of your model with the old version by just uh, mirroring all the traffic between the two and compare their results and determine if the new version is better, does it gives, it does it give better uh, results than, than the old one. Um, another example where traffic mirroring works great is for um, services that are doing, uh, um, that are exposing only get uh, methods, right? Something like a cache. Then you can test the cache sheet between the two versions and stuff like that. But if you are changing data through requests, if you are, let's say, processing a payment and you mirror the traffic for that, then your users will pay twice. Uh, um, and that, that's a bad thing. So don't use traffic mirroring for, uh, for things that are changing state, only for things that are item potent. And the last deployment strategy that Flagger implements is the classical blue-green. And this works great for, I don't know, legacy apps that have some kind of state inside the container um, where you run your tests, then you just switch from one version to another. And yeah, stateful applications are also um, a good candidate for just doing traffic switching. So how the um, progressive uh, rollout looks like, um, Flagger creates uh, the V1 uh, version. So let's say you, you first deploy your app, Flagger looks at it, creates uh, a clone of it, and that clone is exposed to all your clients. So let's say this is V1. You deploy version two, Flagger detects that, scales uh, up the, the version to workload and slowly starts to route traffic towards 5%, 10%, 10%. And you can configure how much traffic you want to route, uh, how fast, and so on. While it does this uh, in, um, traffic incrementation, it also looks at your KPIs and um, does a uh, a read of, of the KPIs and compares them to the thresholds that you've set. If uh, something goes wrong, um, the traffic is routed back to V1 and V2 is scaled down and you get a notification that your new deployment failed. If everything goes okay, then Flagger will be doing a, um, Kubernetes uh, rolling deployment and replace V1 with V2, then it scales down uh, the V2 workload. In an A-B testing, you just use some header or some cookie. Um, the same thing happens. Um, and in the blue-green, you tell Flagger to run conformance tests. Uh, you tell Flagger to run low tests and see that version two can cope with uh, lots of traffic. And if those tests are okay, then you make the whole uh, switch. So how, how can you define all these things um, in Git? Well, with some YAML, <laughs> of course. Uh, Flagger comes with a custom resource called Canary. And the custom resource, um, with this custom resource, you define how the release process should look like. 
um, you tell Flagger where the deployment is. So you can uh, point Flagger to a deployment or a, a daemon set. Then you tell Flagger with, with the service uh, definition how you want your application to be exposed inside the cluster and outside the cluster if, uh, if you are using, for example, Istio. And the most important part is the analysis definition where you can set interval thresholds, metrics, um, you can define alerts, you can define webhooks that are triggering uh, integration tests and so on. Now we'll get into that uh, very shortly. So now I want to go back to the goal of writing as little YAML as possible. But let's say you want to do um, canary deployment without any kind of automation, you just do it on your own with uh, manifests, with YAML, right? So the first thing you have to do is duplicate your deployment YAML. Like you have to have a deployment for the current version and a deployment for the new version. Now, problem is maybe for that deployment, you also have horizontal pod auto scales. So you have to duplicate those as well, right? So you can target both versions of your app. Um, also, you have to create dedicated um, Kubernetes services inside your cluster for each, um, each deployment, each replica set. Then you need to create service mesh objects like virtual services. You define routes, you define the weight uh, for each route. You have to map your, uh, the ports from your container into the Kubernetes uh, service into the mesh objects, right? Those ports have to be the same all over the place. And well, depending on what uh, service mesh you choose, it can get complicated or not, uh, all this part. Now, if you opt and choose Flagger to do your, um, your canary setup, Flagger needs a deployment spec, an horizontal pod scaler, this is optional if you want to scale based, let's say, based on requests or other things. And you create this canary object. All the other things, the duplication of the deployments, the duplication of the horizontal pod autoscales, the duplication of secrets, config maps, and all things that are part of your application flagger does that on its own based on the canary definition. Also based on the canary definition, the the service uh, field in, in that definition creates all the service mesh objects for you. And this allows you to switch from one service mesh to another. For example, a canary definition looks the same if you are using Istio or if you are using app mesh or if you are using Linkerd, for example, or if you are using just ingress controllers. Um, the changes, even if there are changes, maybe in the matrix name and stuff like that, there are very small changes. So you can easily migrate from one platform to another um, by just telling Flagger, hey, right now uh, you should be using Istio. Right now you should be using Linkerd and so on. And Flagger will create all these objects uh, for you. What are you saying, Lee? <laughs> uh, sorry, what, Stefan? <laughs> How do you feel about all this? Oh, I mean, Flagger is probably like my favorite thing that that is in the Weave catalog of open source projects. And everything that you've talked about is a great follow-up of technical detail to um, to Mr. Monk Chip's uh, progressive delivery keynote from yesterday. And so if you get to a point, right, where your team has good maturity, right, you're doing frequent enough releases where things are breaking and you've got the metrics and the storage, you're now starting to look at why things are breaking, then you're in a perfect place to adopt some progressive delivery. And explaining the value of adopting Flagger as opposed to trying to do your own thing. Um, to a team I think is pretty no-brainer because the real 
the real techniques that are needed uh, are not being done in a declarative way. Uh, when you look at implementations of how traffic shifting is accomplished uh, from the past, you know, decade of big companies, you know, um, Netflix and uh, Airbnb sharing how they do things, that they're usually serial workflows uh, that run from an event-based, you know, kind of uh, runner outside the cluster. And when you look at Flagger being a declaratively driven, so it works with GitOps, um, controller that's reconciling that runs in a pretty highly or a highly resilient mode inside of Kubernetes using a pull-based workflow, um, as opposed to trying to prevent race conditions and do like release locking inside of some script in a CI job, it just it makes so much more sense. Uh, and then the flexibility and the concise nature of the Flagger API, the fact that we've like been able to build something that interfaces so cleanly with many different kinds of meshes and load balancers uh, is just icing on the cake. So um, yeah, I, I get really excited when you talk about Flagger. There's so many other things too. Somebody uh, in the channel was saying, wow, if only we had Flagger for multiple clusters. And the fact that we can share that, you know, Flagger does actually work on multi-cluster meshes and people have it deployed and it's working. You know, it's, um, it's a really edgy, um, great example of a very high level controller that demonstrates the power of GitOps and Kubernetes. And, uh, just compliments to you as well for all of the incredible work that you put in day in, week in, week out to, to make Flagger work for all of our users. because. It's a it's a great tool. Um, Thank you. There there are prerequisites. You know, you might not be ready for Flagger out of the box, but but once you've met those prerequisites that Stefan mentioned at the beginning of this talk, and you're ready to start making those kinds of team decisions, I think the Flagger can give you so much value. You know? Yeah, I, I want to <clears throat> talk about how Flagger works with with uh, GitOps. Right. Here in this image, you see that there are two deployments, two services, two Kubernetes services, an ingress that can be, I don't know, an Istio virtual service or a, a contour ingress controller or whatever. Um, something that Flagger can control to, to ship, uh, ship, shape traffic. I, the, the GitOps reconcilers, they are acting on the, on the, on the deployment spec. So Flagger cannot change that object because if it changes that object, then the reconciler will say, hey, someone changed that, I'm going to undo it. So instead of doing that, when you tell Flagger, hey, I want to run a, a, a release for that particular deployment, it creates a clone of that object. And it clones it and adds the minus primary suffix to it. Mm -hmm. It also does, um, it discovers what other things are making your app. For example, a deployment may be using a config map mounted as an environment variable, um, or maybe using a secret that's mounted as a volume and stuff like that. All these things, all these manifest config map secrets are part of your app representation somehow. It's not just the deployment. So we, we've seen in the last year, a lot of incidents, um, big incidents were from cloud vendors that were triggered by a misconfiguration. So it wasn't the actual version of that app, the container, the, the code that is running there, it was a change in the configuration that triggered uh, make a major incident. So Flagger tries to protect you against this kind of things. And by default, what it does, it uh, does a snapshot of all the secrets and all the config maps that are being used in your deployment. And it duplicates them, it also has them minus primary suffix. And the actual deployment that's exposed to your users are is using all these, uh, 
all these secrets and config maps uh, clones. When you change something in a config map, from a flagger perspective, is the same as you will be changing something in your deployment spec. It is a change. Then it needs to run uh, a release for it. it. Needs to do analysis and so on. So it tries to also protect users against um, misconfigurations. So because it cannot modify the original deployment, what it does, it scales that deployment to zero once is no longer in use. Let's say the release has succeeded and it will scale it to zero. And the trick is to use an horizontal pod auto scale. Like if you specify the number of replicas inside your deployment spec, Flagger will scale it to zero, then Flux will say, hey, I have like count two here in my, in my definition and it will uh, scale it up again. Well, there is no traffic going to that, but it will take up resources on your cluster. So the trick that's implied here, instead of specifying the replica count inside the deployment, you specify it in an horizontal pod uh, autoscaler definition. Now, the horizontal pod autoscaler knows it doesn't have to act on a deployment that's being scaled to zero, right? Even if the mean replica is five, let's say. If it's scaled to zero, it will leave it like that and waits for someone else to scale it to one and from there, the horizontal pod autoscaler will take it over and uh, do the, the mean replicas. So Flagger works great with GitOps if you use horizontal pod autoscalers to define the minimum and maximum uh, uh, replicas. Also, and you I can wanna, use what? I want to tie this back to one more thing that you said in the previous talk, uh, which is that the thing that you want to operate on in GitOps, the important part about it is the minimal description of your intent. And you, have, you can have comments, you can go wild, right? Putting things into the repo. So you talked about the Istio operator custom resource. And then we also had the Helm, um, the Helm release resource. Right? These are very minimal configs. So now the Canary resource is this other high order uh, custom resource that has a controller that operates a very ornate intent inside of the cluster so that you can get away from having to copy deployments, change an ingress rule to change weights and things like that. Now it's captured in the policy, right? And that goes back to that goal of write less YAML. Yeah. Capture your intent more carefully. Definitely. Yeah, and Flagger, based on, on the same canary uh, specification, Flagger can create objects for all these technologies. For example, it will create Istio objects if your uh, service mesh choice is Istio. It will create SMI uh, traffic ship objects if you are going with Linkerd. It will create virtual routers and virtual nodes if you are going with uh, AWS app mesh. But not everybody is ready for service meshes. Um, so early on, uh, Flagger only worked with Istio. That was the first implementation I did. And Nginx was the second one because the Nginx ingress is so widely used everywhere. And people say, OK, I'm not ready to switch everything to a service mesh, but I want to do A-B testing, or I want to do uh, canary rollouts for my uh, web APIs, and I'm exposing those outside with Nginx. Well, Nginx has a way uh, to control traffic weight, or has a way to set up uh, header filters and cookies. It's not the best way. It's through annotations, because the Kubernetes ingress definition, uh, the V1 uh, ingress definition, doesn't allow you to you know, um, go deep into how traffic should be routed. Um, so for, for, for Nginx ingress to be able to capture this extra information that the ingress doesn't have, it has to look at particular uh, annotations. So what Flagger does, it, it manipulates uh, these kind of annotations. It creates a, an, ingress, uh, an ingress definition clone. It puts them there and so on. 
for modern ingress controllers like Blue and Contour, which are based on Envoy, uh, these controllers uh, come with their own custom resources where you can define uh, how ingress should work. Uh, and you, know, you have uh, objects that let you set up weights that let you create uh, this kind of header uh, routing and so on. So Flagger also works with this kind of ingress controls and creates these objects for you. And on the doc side, I have uh, for, for each, for each uh, integration, there is a dedicated tutorial that shows you how you can do it. But if you look at all of them, like there aren't differences between what you are, how you are specifying the, the release process. It looks the same, but on the back end, other things are happening. So how Flagger validates um, a rollout? First of all, it looks at what Kubernetes offers, like the deployment health status, it checks the readiness, readiness probes, and so on. Um, afterwards, it implements two KPIs that every single service mesh and all the ingress controllers are exposing by default into Prometheus. That's the request success rate percentage. How, from all your traffic, how was the percentage of 500 errors or 404 errors and so on? And another built in metric is the request latency average uh, duration. So uh, you can set SLAs for the average duration and say, okay, if from the request from the last minute, uh, the average is one second. Uh, roll it back is no good, should be a maximum of 500 milliseconds. Then there is a, a custom resource called metric template where you can create your custom checks, where you can define Prometheus queries and other things uh, and target your business metrics or any kind of um, I don't know, metric that your application exposes and you want to take decisions based on that flagger cannot know about all of those. So you can, through templates, you can create your own custom checks. And um, the last thing, um, the validation process can also uh, contain integration tests and load tests uh, through webhooks. So in terms of Metric templates, um, you can define Prometheus queries, you can um, connect to a Datadog instance and write uh, a query that Datadog understands and also CloudWatch. Uh, I'm looking forward to someone that uses InfluxDB or knows the Flux language of InfluxDB. So I think uh, it should You're be- welcome. Yeah, it should be straightforward how you can implement a um, metric pro provider for, for InfluxDB. It should be quite easy to do it. And I don't know, stack driver, there are so many metrics provider out there. Uh, I could spend, uh, I don't know, months implementing all of them. So yeah, I'm looking for people that want to contribute to Flagger and write a metric provider. It's, there is a Go interface, you have to implement that and it's quite, it's quite a straightforward process. Um, now about other thing. Here is where Flagger can route alerts for different things. Let's say you have an on-call team and that on-call team is only interested in has a rollout failed, right? So you can create another provider for them where you specify, let's say the type, is it Slack, it is Microsoft Teams, it's Rocket or whatever. And you can also set the, um, what type of alerts should that team uh, receive. And you can mix and match these, uh, these providers. So you can have dedicated alerts per team. Maybe your QA team wants to be notified every time a rollout starts and stuff like that. So you can go really, really deep into how you want to uh, make these alerts work. 
In terms of webhooks, Flagger has its own, has like a plugin, its own service that uh, comes with uh, um, three load testing tools. What, why is this needed is because maybe you want to deploy at some particular time in the day where you don't have traffic on your app. And Flagger will fail because if it, it, if it doesn't seize any kind of metric, say, hey, I cannot validate uh, your new version. So to cope up with that, you can have, uh, you can set up a load test that calls different uh, API endpoints and Flagger will be using those results to, um, to make a decision. In terms of conformance testing, Flagger can run uh, Helm tests before uh, it starts to, uh, to route traffic to your app. It can run uh, uh, tests written in bash bots, but you can bring your own conformance testing framework. This is not an opinated thing. Like um, the webhook has an interface. You can create your own uh, webhooks in receivers and Flagger will just call that over HTTP and we'll wait for a result. And there are a couple of uh, implementations in, in Flagger repo for uh, all kinds of uh, testing frameworks. Uh, and finally, um, manual gating. So the gating service is very simple. You can open the gate and close the gate. Then there are a couple of uh, webhook types. You can say, I want to confirm the rollout. So before any kind of traffic is routed uh, to the new version, Flagger will ask for confirmation from someone. And that someone has to open a gate. You, I don't, uh, you can do that through a Slack bot or whatever other things you can build a UI, click on a button that calls the, the gating service and opens the gate for that particular uh, release. Or you can set up a gate for uh, the final step, the promotion, you can delay the promotion, or, and you can also roll back at any point in time. Like let's say during the, the release, everything is good, but there is a business decision. We don't want to release this now, let's roll it back. So uh, you can use this type of hook and tell Flagger to, to do the rollback. And this is how it looks like with uh, Flux. So in your cluster repository, you will be having a canary definition and your deployment, Flux synchronizes that, Flagger takes over, um, creates the, the deployment clone, starts the canary analysis, everything is good. It promotes that uh, new version to production. Do I have time for a demo? I think so, right? You got two more, you got a couple more minutes to find how long you think that demo is gonna run us? Let's see. <laughs> we, have, we have a break until the top of the hour. Told Damani he could give you some extra time, but uh yeah, no, no, that's that's fine. I just want to, you know, give him a heads up, but you you're good to go. Five minutes. Okay, Five minutes. let's try. <laughs> okay, so what I'm going to do now, I'm going to tell Flux to synchronize my whole repository. Um and if we look at this repository, besides uh, Istio and Flagger definition, we also have um, our production namespace that has a front end app, a back end app, a load test service, uh, some things for Istio here, a sidecar definition, and a bunch of things. So let's look at the front end app. So the front end app is a, has a deployment YAML, a canary YAML and a horizontal protocol scaler. And if we look at the canary, so we tell Flagger to attach this um, deployment to a public gateway. So if I'm, if I'm looking at in Istio system, I should find out the load balancer address for the Istio gateway. 
Okay, so what happened when I thought Flux has synchronized everything? Flux has created uh, a production namespace. And it created two um, canary objects. And if I'm looking at the pods that are running right now, I'm seeing that the pods that are running are uh, running with the minus primary suffix. Okay, let's say now I want to deploy a new version. I can go into my front end deployment. Flux can do this on its own. I uh, bump the, the version here. I'm going to do it manually. I'm going to set a new version. I'm not going to wait. I'm going to tell Flux to sync the change now. And if I'm going to Canary YAML, Let's see what I've set here. I've set the analysis to run every 15 seconds. If it fails more than 10 times, it should roll back and it should uh, iterate five times every 15 seconds. And I'm going to use a, a segmentation for my users based on user agent. And I'm saying, hey, for the new version, the, the new version should only work for, uh, should only be seen by the Firefox users. So. If I'm looking here, it's 310. If I'm looking in uh, Firefox, it's still the same version for now. So the status changed from initialized to progressing. What Flagger is doing right now is, is running the integration tests. For my, uh, for my new version. And when those will pass, and here it is, it will switch the Firefox users because the integration uh, tests are passing, it switches the Firefox users to the new version. And this is like, this is how A-B testing works. Some parts of your users are on, on the new version. And let's say the majority of them using Chrome <laughs> are on the old version. And When, when the rollout finishes, then um, all users will be switched to 3.1.1. And how can I see what's going on? I'm going to show you, for example, Flagger logs. So it did a lot of things. It created all the Istio objects, virtual services, destination rules um, for canary, for primary. Uh, it created the deployments. And now it's, it started to um, advance the traffic. It measures the, the metrics. At the first run, it couldn't get any kind of metrics because Prometheus uh, is a little bit late, but uh, afterwards, the metrics are there. They are reported by Istio, so the iteration goes on. And the analysis is over. I told it to spin up five times, wait 15 seconds, check all the metrics uh, um, of, of what happened in the last 15 seconds. Now that everything is okay, is doing the final rollout. So it, it promotes this version uh, to everyone. And now all your users are on 3.1.1, the new version. And that's it, uh, very short demo of uh, the Flagger A-B testing. Boom.